So let me start by saying that you cannot deal with issues of maternal, newborn, and child health globally without being invested in the problem from its entirety as the experience of maternal and child health for both families, communities, mothers, children, and also advocates. Let me start with a quotation from one of the most important uh, Nobel laureates from South Asia. So I'm going to cite a few from my own region. And what Ramindranath Tagore, over a century ago, said in walking the streets of Bengal in the wakes of one of the first great famines was that fate had allowed humanity such a pitifully meager coverlet that in pulling it over one part of the world, another had to be left bare. What he was talking about was his personal experience of witnessing enormous inequalities, squalor, and, and misery in his own environment. And his words may reflect a certain sense of, of hopelessness. He did change his views towards the latter end of his life, but what he said about inequality and injustice and the fact that this was fated by many holds true even a century on. And nowhere is this more evident in global health as in the context of maternal and child health. When some of us got together in the scenic city of Bellagio about 15 years ago to draw this map, this was a map of the spectrum of global child deaths all over the world. Each one of these dots represents a cluster of 10,000 deaths. So you could see that the world is not equal and that most of these 10 million deaths in the year 2000 were largely clustered around Africa and South Asia. And South Asia, because of its population density, appears like a red blob. Now, the remarkable thing that's happened in the last 10, 15 years is that we have, for the first time in human history, reduced child mortality at a rate which is unprecedented. So today, as we speak, we are down to around 6 million child deaths annually. We've been able to halve the number of child deaths from 1990. And that's a rate of reduction which has never been witnessed or seen in the entire history of mankind. So that's not a mean achievement. And that should be taken in the context of the Millennium Goals that were coined, which were a two-thirds reduction in child mortality by the year 2015 and a three-quarters reduction in maternal mortality by the same period. So the reduction in child mortality that I've just told you is very much a success story. It's an incomplete success because many countries haven't achieved that target, but it is nevertheless a huge success. The other success is our maternal mortality. So if you look at the reduction in maternal deaths over the same time period, we have been able to reduce maternal mortality from available figures of 1990 by about 45 percent. And it's in the same geographies that you see the clustering of child deaths also. So a huge success of at least putting forward these global targets around maternal and child mortality reduction. The other big advantage of the Millennium Goals being coined was that there has been an increase in funding for low and middle income countries. These are estimates of overseas development assistance for maternal child health. We've just put out some brand new estimates a week ago in the Lancet, and they all indicate that we've gone up to around six billion annual assistance for maternal and child health from figures of close to around two and a half billion just about 10 years ago or so. That's also a global achievement, which has come through advocacy and action, and the fact that maternal and child health has been center stage of the global agenda. Now, this money is not enough, six billion dollars, with about four billion potential recipients or, or people who uh, need that kind of assistance is very little still. But it's up from a figure of around two, two and a half billion. So all of these are real solid data achievements from the Millennium Development Goals process and helps underscore why the Sustainable Development Goals are so important. So if you want to see what are the lessons learned from the MDGs, Things that have gone well are the ones that I've just shared with you. The focus on MNCH, more resources, greater political discourse, concrete initiatives. 
So I chaired the countdown process. The countdown process was set up because a few friends, not even funded organization, a few friends after Bellagio got together and said, we need to do something about monitoring and evaluation. So this morning when I was talking about the importance of individuals, as opposed to moneyed individuals, it was because at the end of the day, the translation into action is done by advocates and done by technical people who are vested uh, in, in, into the issues themselves. And also I think a big success of the MDGs was that it had concrete measurable goals and targets that every country could somehow or the other strive to put forward, whether they were indicators, whether they were mortality rates, whatever. What did not do very well in the MDGs? So stuff that wasn't ideal was that there was absolutely no mention on equity, of equity in the Millennium MDG goal setting process. I was part of the committee that set up the MDG goals and targets at that time, and no one even mentioned equity because it was a foreign concept. And it was only picked up fairly late in the process. And I'll be speaking about equity a little more. We did not have a rights dimension. I think we blundered by not putting in non-communicable diseases. It was mentioned at that stage and then brushed aside. And now, so many years on, we are seeing a, a, almost a, a swing of the pendulum to the other extreme because they have been ignored. And I think putting in the NCDs would have been even more beneficial to maternal and child health. And you could all talk, talk about fragmentation and some of the other issues. But I want to talk about some specifics which we have learned over this process in terms of what else did the Millennium Development Goals miss. One of those issues you have had too much of in the last five days, and I want to underscore this. And that was the whole disconnect between child mortality and neonatal mortality. We could not and did not have the data to put in neonatal mortality as a separate target. And it was only in 2005, after the Lancet series came out, that the whole issue of neonatal mortality being a major gorilla in the room came out. So if you look at the slopes of reduction in child deaths, you will see that slope is very different from the reduction in neonatal deaths. And that's partly because the eye does not see what the mind doesn't know. Secondly, that solutions for neonatal mortality are very different for solutions for under five mortality. So the Bill Gates of the world can stand up and say that vaccines save so many lives of children. True, but they don't necessarily save lives of newborns that require investments in entirely different interventions and packages. And this is easier to understand once you see the envelope of child mortality. So if you look at the envelope of child mortality, neonatal deaths are 44%, and they are related to things that require investments in mothers and investments in postnatal care. But be that as it may, you will notice that today as we speak still around 20% of all under five deaths, half of all postneonatal child deaths are related to diarrhea and pneumonia. We have absolutely no basis for losing a single child anywhere because of diarrhea. It's a completely treatable disorder. If today a child was to walk into the emergency room of the hospital where I spend half of my time in Toronto and die of diarrhea and dehydration, I can guarantee you that would be headline news on national media the very next day. But today, we still lose about 800,000 children because of diarrheal diseases. So the whole issue around what is an incomplete and unfinished agenda around Millennium Goals is very important. So these are newborns. So that's one extreme of childhood. Let me take you to the other extreme of childhood and tell you why adolescents are so important in the new agenda. And I'll give you some reasons why. So this is from our IERG report a couple of years ago when we said that adolescents are completely missing in the global discourse of every woman, every child, or the strategies for women in child health. And people could not understand why were we focusing in 2013 on adolescents. Let me tell you why. Firstly, if you look at overall age-specific mortality reduction over the last 50 plus years, so these are data 
from 1955 from available databases on mortality reduction or mortality change across all countries, including EEC data. So yes, child mortality has gone down like this. And I've already told you this, under five child mortality, remarkable reduction. What is the rate or change in deaths amongst children between 15 to 19 years of age? It is a flat line. There has been no change, as has not been a discernible change in the age group between 20 and 24. So adolescents and young women, in terms of global burden of disease, have been completely missing from the equation. The WHO put out these causes of adolescent deaths last year. Many of you have seen that. This is in their WHO document referenced here. And you see the usual suspects. Injuries, self-harm, infections, interpersonal violence, drowning, etc. These are all the big causes of deaths that they have. What is missing here? The big missing thing in this WHO report was that in many parts of the world, including mine, adolescents in low and middle income countries are very different from adolescents in high income countries. These are young adults who are sometimes forced into adulthood and lose their childhood. And the big issue there is particularly girls who are forced into early marriage, either by social norms or by coercion. So if you look at women who were giving birth noted to be giving birth before the age of 18, I want you to see the source. This is from the World Fertility Survey in 1986, 30 years ago. So the figures that you see here are that in Africa is around 28% and Latin America and Asia around 18 to 20%. These were the figures that are known for that time. What are the figures today, 30 years on, from the recent UNFPA report? These are the figures. We are talking about still 20% of all of those who give birth being under 18 years of age. And if you look at this side, 3 to 4% of all births in low and middle income countries are before the age of 15. So it's largely children giving birth to children. And it's not an issue which is across all age and socioeconomic strata. It is particularly a problem of the poorest of the poor. So when we talk about adolescent health as an unfinished and unrecognized agenda, it is because it's central to some of the issues around reproductive maternal health outcomes, which have intergenerational consequences. And that's why, in terms of looking at causes of death, you have to be aware of statistics that actually put the whole thing in context. So these are data from the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation. And when you look at causes of death for boys, you've got all kinds of things that relate to violence, injuries, accidents, uh, uh, drug abuse even in some settings. And for girls, about a third of all of these causes relate to things that are directly relevant to reproductive health, maternal hemorrhage, abortions, hypertensive disorders, and so on. So it's an extremely important area and that's why we want it absolutely front and central in the SDGs. The other reason why we want it in there is that it is an issue of low and middle income countries. If you look at where adolescents live currently, even though there may be a greater focus in high income settings, but nine out of 10 adolescents today live in low and middle income countries. So it's very much a global developmental agenda. The other issue that I've talked about is the fact that we live and see maternal child health in unstable environments. So let me throw this figure at you. One third, almost 34% of all under five deaths and maternal deaths today are in countries which are either in the midst of acute or chronic conflict. So conflict in whatever its dimensions and descriptions uh, that we have is a very important underlying factor in terms of global maternal and child health. And it has consequences that go way beyond survival. So if you look at the psychosocial uh, consequences of living and growing up in conflict, it is not only the acute consequences like post-traumatic stress, it is chronic exposure and lack of coping mechanisms, and 
impacts that we now recognize may be intergenerational. Some 16 years ago, I wrote a paper which uh, uh, was a labor of love because it was written within a few hours. But it was a paper on the children of war. And it was written about the whole generation that was affected by conflict in the north of my own country and in Afghanistan. And today, 16, 17 years on, I have my friends from Afghanistan here. The sad reality is that many of those children that lived and thrived or saw their lives impacted by conflict are in the middle of conflict today as players because violence has that effect at a very critical period of development. Which brings me to the next thing that the MDGs missed, which was the whole context of life beyond survival. So if you look at human development and what happens to a developing brain, there are very critical periods where many neural functions are developed. And this data from Chuck Nelson tells you that your vision and hearing largely develops very early within the first few months of life. And your language development peaks at around two years, one and a half to two years, and then so on with your higher cognitive functions. And if you put it all together, you will understand why the first thousand days are so important. This term, the first thousand days, related to pregnancy in the first two years of life, where much of this neurodevelopmental mechanisms are largely complete. But we, rec we now know two more things as we enter this sustainable development goal era. One is that it's not the first thousand days. It is actually the period before pregnancy also. So it ideally ought to be a longer period like the first 2,000 days. And that brain development in children continues right into adolescence. And therefore, you should not look at these early exposures only in the context of under five children. If you know this graphic, you will understand why we want an emphasis of going beyond mortality to the whole issue of human development in the sustainable development goals. Because just focusing on saving lives is not enough if the quality of those lives and exposures are not going to be well. Very quickly, I think addressing social determinants is important. And there are a huge number of social determinants, but I want to bring some concepts in there for you to understand. So firstly, you know, we look at mortality generally by many determinants, such as, for example, geography, residence, urban and rural. That's the way we typically put this. And these are data from, um, uh, from Pakistan. As you can see, yeah, rural mortality is higher than urban mortality, consistent across various surveys. Big deal. Very, fairly well known. The other way that we do this is by looking at income or asset quintiles. So we look at the poor versus the rich. I say the poorest have higher rates of mortality compared to the richest. Then we compare them over time to see what change has taken place. And as you can see in this particular survey, the, the reduction in mortality, at least in Pakistan, has been largely among the rich. The rates of mortality amongst the poorest have not changed. So these are useful concepts, academic concepts, to have around the whole measure of equity by income and assets. But the problem is, that no policymaker, at least none that I know from low and middle income countries, knows where these poorest quintiles are. As is frequently said, my friend Seth Berkeley says that you know, every fifth child is not immunized. But the problem is that the fifth child is not standing next to the fourth child. So it's difficult to pinpoint where these people are. And that's why we are moving away from these kind of depictions of inequalities to what is much more relevant geographic and administrative geospatial depiction of poverty and therefore risks of adverse outcomes. So these are data for Pakistan on where the poorest socioeconomic quintiles live. And as you can see from here, they not only live in rural areas, they also sometimes live within the urban populations, the urban slums. And therefore, geographic mapping of poverty and socioeconomic inequalities has become even more important. And you can see some of those relationships against outcomes like stunting, as you see. It's the same districts that you have the poorest live, that you have the highest rates of stunting. I want to take a minute to talk about malnutrition. 
And since I've spoken about stunting, you've been told that malnutrition underlies about half, 45% of all child deaths. And it's important to understand malnutrition given its various dimensions. So firstly, if you are stunted, your risk of dying is about six folds higher from all cause mortality or diarrhea and pneumonia that I've mentioned. And if you are wasted, severely wasted, that risk goes up to about 12 folds. So both severe wasting and, and stunting greatly increase your risk of mortality. But what people haven't really focused on is the relationship of maternal malnutrition and adverse outcomes in childhood. And what do I mean by that? If you look at the mother-baby dyad, and you remember what I just told you about the preconception period, maternal nutrition very strongly influences fetal development and also risks of prematurity. Those risks can be identified through various risk factors and risk groups. So if you look at women who are wasted, people don't recognize that in many parts of the world that proportion can be as high as around 20%, 25% of the population. In South Asia, in some areas, 30 to 40% of women have a BMI less than 18.5. And they are also associated with micronutrient deficiencies. These are slightly older data about chronic energy deficiency and, and BMI data for various geographies. And it's not therefore surprising that you have a distribution of fetal growth retardation or small for gestational aid births, which is very homologous with where you have the clustering of mortality. So I wanted to show you some of those risk relationships in the context of SGA. So small for gestational aid births are about 30 million overall. And a large proportion of these are term SGA births. But you will notice this small proportion, which is babies born premature, who are also small. And the importance of knowing this small group is that that's where mortality clusters. So if you look at relative risk of mortality, this small subgroup of babies who are born preterm and small for gestational age have a relative risk of dying in the neonatal period about 25 to 30 folds. So I don't have time to go through a lot of this, but the importance of recognizing maternal malnutrition as a major contributor to child malnutrition and long-term effects is this very close relationships and long-term programming. And we now know that about 20% of all stunting in children, and it may be more in certain geographies, is directly contributed to by being small and maternal malnutrition. So I could not make a stronger case for the link between the mother, baby, and child in this very natural continuum of relationships that start even before birth, and they continue right up to adolescence and perhaps across generations. Finally, a word about family planning before I come to interventions. This is uh, a quote from my friend um, Kamarogo, who said, family planning to maternal health is what immunization is to child health. And what was he talking about? He was talking about very clearly the relationship between family planning and not only a range of outcomes for mothers as well as newborns, as you can see, where the birth interval is less than six to 12 months, birth to pregnancy interval, you will find that the rates of mortality and complications increase exponentially. In, in Pakistan, if you have a birth interval, which is less than 18 months, the risk of stunting in the subsequent child is significantly higher. And that is a reflection of maternal depletion. And we have no data on consequences for the mother herself. So these are important relationships that one needs to peg in. So let me very quickly in a few minutes talk about where the solutions are and what can be done. So fortunately, this is not a, a barren landscape. A lot has happened in the last decade on key evidence-based interventions across the continuum of care, many of them led by academia and Lancet series, and I will not go through this, in a very important consensus-based development. Uh, our university partnered with PMNCH and WHO to generate these essential interventions on which there is now complete consensus that we not only need to have them, we need to roll them out. And in many cases, governments have used these 
to develop also specific action plans. And in the last two years, you've had the action plan for diarrhea and pneumonia, you had the action plan for nutrition, and last year we had the action plan for every newborn that you've heard about, and I'll not go through this in detail. So if all of that is true, why hasn't the world changed? And the world hasn't changed because research findings themselves and publications don't change the world. Implementation does. And if you look at the reality of where we are right now, you may or may not have seen this graph, which is from our, our, our recent Lancet countdown paper. This is the coverage rate of interventions that all of us know about. We do very well with some interventions. What are these? These are largely vaccinations, programs that are driven vertically. When you come to interventions that require functional health systems, especially those functioning 24 hours, 24 seven, things that require care at delivery, postnatal care, or management of children with diarrhea and pneumonia, things go south. And for many of these, we have not been able to either go above global averages about 30 to 40% coverage, but we have also seen tremendous differences between country. Each one of these dots is a country. So one point in the equity dimension that you should note is that there is enormous difference between countries in terms of what countries have been able to achieve. And there's also differences within countries between people who have access and don't have access. And, and you know, I've already talked to you about this. But I do want to ask a question of you that nobody has asked of us in the last few days. Why does equity matter in our global strategy for maternal, newborn, and child health? And the person who I think nailed it was the head of UNICEF, Tony Lake, who within a few weeks of his assuming office, some years ago now, made the following statement. And what Tony Lake said was that we find that our statistical national successes or averages are masking tremendous moral and practical failures and we leave behind people simply because they live either in difficult geographies, in conflict zones, either marginalized populations or disabilities or because of their gender. What did he mean by this? Let me show you one example to make the case. So this is a complex graph, but I will simplify this. So what you see on this graphic is countries which have not had a change in their under five mortality or countries that have reduced their under five mortality, those that have done so with a reduction in inequality and those that have seen an increase in inequality. So if you look at these countries in red here, they've had a significant reduction in mortality over this period of time, but also a widening equity gap. So what has happened is that the rich in these countries, the relative more privileged, have had access much more than the poor, and that's why you find that this success, so-called success, in this bunch of countries, and I'll not embarrass them by naming it, are masking tremendous increasing inequities and gaps within those countries. So that's why equity matters. That's why in moving forward, we have to make sure that we don't leave anybody behind. And that's the principle that you have been told around universal health care, but universal health care with an equity lens. So what I bit my tongue because I wanted to say is that universal health care has one major disadvantage if you do not have an equity lens. Why? Because the first people to access universal health care privileges in any society would be the rich would be the people who have first right, who have, mo who have mobility, who have knowledge, who have access to education, and will go and get those services because it's all of a sudden everybody's right. Under targeting, we can target the poor. Under universal health care, it is everybody's right. You cannot deny anybody this. So therefore, you have to have, moving forward, a very clear equity lens in your strategies. So, let me close by saying that all of the success that I've told you about is unfinished agenda. That with the Millennium Goals and the things that we have missed in the last 10, 15 years, our statistical global average success in reducing mortality to 6 million from 10 million and maternal mortality reduction hides behind it tremendous differences and countries and people 
who have been left behind. And therefore, we cannot approach 2016 with waving a flag of victory to say, it's job done, let's move on to something else. There has to be a very clear focus on moving forward in that strategy, because if we don't, this is what the world will look like in the year 2030. These are projected data on current trends, trends to show you what the world will look like for under five mortality in the year 2030. And it's the same countries of the world that currently have the clustering of mortality who will still have disproportionately high mortality. So we, we have to do something differently. So this is why in moving with interventions, we have to make a difference. And that's why what Joy Lawn said and others are more than slogans. These are real targets that countries have to aspire to. And these are packages of care which, if delivered at scale, have the potential of saving an additional 3 million lives of women and children and newborns. And these lives will be saved by focusing on a few things. So one message that I do want to reiterate, because I don't think anyone else has made this other than Joy, is the focus on the day of birth. If you do nothing in this quest, but just focus on the day of birth, you will have a huge impact because that's where deaths are currently clustered. And you will not only save more than a million newborn lives on the day of birth and around 100,000, about a third of the current maternal deaths, but you will also save 1.2 million stillbirths that nobody talks about. And this is a hugely important area of focus because care at the day of birth in the hands of a skilled attendants and good facilities with good quality has to be the cornerstone of our new global strategy. It will also require not only care during childbirth, as I've just mentioned, but also improvements in our antenatal care packages. And just look at this. I wanted to show you that our recent analysis, which is coming out in The Lancet, will show you that preconception care, care before birth, before pregnancy, has a potential of saving so many lives. And it also has the potential of saving lives across more than one generation. We can certainly look for a world where the target, global target for child mortality is an aspirational less than 20 per thousand life births. Some people will say that's impossible, but if we don't set ourselves that target, we will never get there. So we are aiming to reduce newborn deaths from three million almost to less than a million by the year 2030. And, and and already a large number of countries have signed up to this. We want to end preventable stillbirths and the global target of eliminating intrapartum stillbirths and going down from 2.6 to 1.1 million stillbirths and also significantly reducing maternal mortality to less than 70. So these are not pie in the sky. These are very important targets that we have and they are clearly important parts of the sustainable development goals. So in our SDGs, we want to keep women and children in adolescent health center. These are people-centric goals, and, and they are based on a consensus process around evidence-based, but as was said, informed health systems and implementation. The consensus is that we do want to include non-communicable diseases in sustainable development goals and focus on universal health care as a cornerstone with an equity lens. And we also want, importantly, to go beyond the health sector. So a lot of people are very upset that health has only got one goal in the entire 17 Sustainable Development Goals. I say it's fantastic that we are beginning to recognize that you can never deal with health from within the health sector. In the parts of the world that I work in, in Africa and Asia, you can never deal with nutrition from within health alone. It has got much more to do with sectors here, like food security, like education, climate change urbanization, water sanitation and hygiene, and therefore more power to the elbow of governments who want to address health through a broad lens of environment and on living conditions and other factors. There are clear targets, and these clear targets can only be achieved if we have good monitoring and evaluation. So, let me close, ladies and gentlemen, by saying that we have a tremendous opportunity within the Sustainable Development Goals of staying the course. We also 
have enormous opportunity of including adolescent health and preconception care. And there is already tremendous movement in the every woman, every child agenda of increasing the role of nutrition overall and including early child development or quality of care dimensions within this. And this can only happen if we change our mindsets. Our mindsets around the whole approach of maternal and child health. And let me finish by quoting from another Nobel laureate from, uh, from Bengal, from uh, Bangladesh, who said this a few years ago. And Muhammad Yunus, in making his comments on how he had achieved the impossible, made the statement that his greatest challenge had been to change the mindset of people. He said, mindsets play strange tricks on us. We see things the way our minds have instructed our eyes to see. Thank you very much for your attention. So we have uh, a few minutes for questions. And uh, so I'll open it to the people in, in the room. There are a couple of microphones uh, around the rooms. So please raise your hand and, uh, and go ahead. Any questions? This time, yeah, Juan. Um, many thanks, Sophie. Um, now that you're referring to the SDGs, and and it seems that the way they look like, there will be 17, one for health, and the discussion is now about the indicators, and there is a lot of fuss about the, how the indicators will be shaped. Um, the first draft that we have seen seems rather um, complex, vague, ambiguous, and sometimes difficult to understand. Um, to which extent do you think that discussion is relevant and we should, as uh, stakeholders, engage in having the best indicators possible? Or do you think this is, we have to focus more on political will, advocacy, and resource mobilization? Well, that's a great question. It's an important question to answer. So, Again, this is one of those examples of uh, a very unnecessary uh, process of self-flagellation around these indicators. And I'll tell you why. Uh, you know, when the MDGs were coined, as I said, there wasn't a democratic process of global discussion, discourse. As many of you know, it was just coined by a small group of people, put out, and everybody signed up to it in New York in 2000. I mean, all countries signed up to it. Now, this time around, the whole process has been one of the most remarkable global discourses and a process of engagement with civic society, countries, academics, uh, practitioners, bilaterals. In some ways, it's been too much. And that's why you have you had these 160 indicators that everybody wanted. And even now, people want more. And people want more complex indicators. I, I would say, let that be. We are eventually going to end up, by October, with, by January, I think, with a set of about 100 indicators, of which some indicators will take years to begin collecting data on, because they're brand new indicators. But if we don't start now, we will never get there. What will happen is that countries will vote by continuing to collect key indicators around things that they are currently doing. They are a part of their monitoring and evaluation systems and health surveys. So MNCH core indicators will remain. But we will bring in additional information on key groups like adolescents, like some of the gaps around case management, and importantly, the whole set of indicators around environment and, and social sectors. My sense is that at the end, this will be dictated by resources and what countries are owning up and buying up. We are not going to see a sudden set of haphazard activities around collecting 100 indicators. As you know, the COIA indicators, the Commission for Information and Accountability, forced us to have only 11 indicators. And even within COIA, there was a major movement to cut those 11 indicators down to around eight or nine. We finally had to negotiate with Margaret Chan to say, no, please, the pneumonia indicator is very important. Leave it in. Uh, so eventually, people will have a parsimonious set, and others will collect a larger one. Mortality indicators will remain. Environmental indicators, like WASH, will have much better quality. Adolescent health will come in with one or two sentinel indicators. So bottom line, don't worry about it. Countries will decide what they need to do 
around this, and it will happen by a gradual iterative process over the next 10 years. Thank you. Uh, more questions? So Maria, uh, here in the front. No, thank you so much for this clear and, and inspiring presentation. And I, I was wondering on the, the issue of equity, so you make a very strong point that uh, you may have universal coverage, but if you don't emphasize equity, you may even have uh, a widening inequalities. And, uh, and then I, uh, there is, a, to, uh, and the question is to, to which extent there is, um, there is room for a more ambitious uh, understanding of uh, human rights in terms of uh, basic life conditions. There was a very recent editorial in Lancet from Jonathan Summit developing the idea that perhaps the way to move forward for air, from air pollution it's just to consider clean aid as a human right. But obviously there is a huge gap for doing that. Which, which is your view on this issue? So after, so that's again a great question and requires a very lengthy discussion. Uh, so after Jim Grant died and UNICEF went away from a child survival agenda to a period of leadership where, human, where child rights was the framework, We've actually witnessed firsthand that irrespective of the appropriateness of a rights-based agenda or a rights-based implementation, it's a very difficult concept to translate on the ground. So uh, even in communist states, even in states where egalitarian was their, egalitarianism was their political motive, um, there isn't anything like a rights-based agenda. So my, and the concern of many of my colleagues is that at the end of the day, uh, a rights-based agenda would have to have an implementation framework and ownership by countries, which has to be pragmatic around what their policies and programs are like. Let me be more specific. I have nothing against universal health care. I mean, let me very, be very clear on this. I'm a strong supporter of universal health care, but a strong supporter of universal health care on a framework of rights for people who need universal health care. At this point in time, if you go to any country in South Asia, so you will find, let's take India as an example, okay? Let's take Pakistan as an example. You have apex institutions providing cancer treatment, cardiovascular disease, and you want to operate in liver transplant center, you will have chief ministers and politicians sign a check for that tomorrow, because that's visible, that has political support, that has you know, an affliction that affects politicians rather than poor children living in rural populations. What will happen over the next 10 years with a universal health care agenda is that you are asks for a very limited health budget. Unless budgets expand dramatically, which is not going to happen, that your asks on a limited health budget will increase dramatically. All of a sudden, you have to have insurance systems to provide drugs for diabetes, for hypertension, for cardiovascular disease, and that means that the fiscal envelope will have to make do with a lot more asks, and something will have to give. And our fear is that unless you protect and ring fence the funding for MNCH, what will happen is that funding will shrink because of political expediency. And unfortunately, women and children do not have a political voice. People with hepatitis C have a political voice. Do you know how long it took for hepatitis C drug, the, the, the recent drug, which is you know, 90 plus thousand dollars in the West and even a thousand dollars in Pakistan today to get registered in the Ministry of Health, Ministry of Health in Pakistan, five days. <laughs> it has taken us five years to get oral amoxicillin in our essential drugs list and agenda. It took five days to get hepatitis C drug uh, from, um, uh, from, from this particular a pharmaceutical group into our drugs list. See, that's the power of, of unequal uh, hierarchies right now. So, um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm very fearful that without ring fencing resources, universal health care, even with the insurance and other things, will lead to inequities within expenditures of health, and maternal and child health might be one of the first victims, unless people like us stand up and say, no, you don't touch my money. 
if anything, you increase it. Yeah, L linking, thank you, linking this with uh, the, the, the issue of rights on, on the first day, Joy Loan mentioned the issue of uh, uh, the lack of registration. And uh, I know this is not necessarily a subject uh, that the scientific or even the public health community is uh, concerned about in their everyday lives, but uh, to what extent do you think from this uh, rights uh, perspective and at the same time being able to make this constituency or this problem emerge, the issue of uh, increased registration of child deaths uh, uh, needs to be uh, somehow uh, faced more intensively by governments and by international uh, agencies or, or uh, uh, somehow dynamics? So uh, I think more important than perhaps death registration to me is the importance of birth registration. And, and I think what Joy was probably alluding to is the, is the absolute necessity of ensuring that every child, every woman has the right to have her birth, live or dead, registered, a certification issued for every live birth, and that be used for many of the, of the um, 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 uh, rights that families and children have to education, to immunization, et cetera. And it's not very expensive. We now come from economies and from countries where you know, both India and Pakistan have one of the most sophisticated systems of uh, registration, electronic cards. You know, this card, if you swipe, it will give you everything, including which banks I bank with and you know, where did I buy my last car, perhaps. I mean, that's the nature of the state of the art. Yet, these very countries are unable to register and record over 70% of their births, and leave alone deaths, which have to come from uh, you know, sample registration systems. So I think Joy was absolutely right in that you know, we need to start counting this, because the first step in being accountable is that you have to have a number. The eye does not see. I mean, that's what, uh, um, what Muhammad Yunus was talking about, is that we have to change our mindsets around this. And in some ways, those would be the small first steps towards ensuring that that particular constituency uh, gets its fundamental rights. Thank you. Uh, yes, a question here, please, microphone. Well, so we'll take a couple of more questions. Um, thank, thank you, you, Professor, for your nice presentation. I'm Adam from Ethiopia. Just a very uh, quick question. As we see, the world has already built its nuclear bomb. But what's wrong with the, uh, what's wrong with it to manage maternal and child deaths with these huge resources on the planet? Thank you. So I come from a country which has a bomb, and, uh, and therefore I stand with you completely that I think if countries need to have, they need to develop, they need to develop across all platforms. And therefore the world as a whole, you know, we estimated that our funding gap around maternal and child survival is no more than $10 billion annually, $10 billion. How much is $10 billion? You know how much we are spending on conflict today? The cost of the Afghan war, the cost of war in the Middle East is hundredfold that. We have already spent more on the current conflicts over the last 15 years than we have ever in the history. All the world wars combined together have, have not cost us that much. We have no qualms about spending that kind of money. But let me tell you that I think before we criticize the global powers, uh, you're from Ethiopia, I'm from Pakistan. We need to criticize our own countries in terms of relative defense or what I call offense expenditures. So we spend about 40%, some people say actually 60% of our entire budget on defense. And the argument there is that it is, require, it is a requirement for our existence that is in, because of the threats that we have, we have to make that expenditure. I think the, the, the problem is many of those threats are internal. And if you do not invest in your human development, in your people, in the lives, livelihoods, and the future of your people, that threat is much greater than the threats outside of your borders. So I think in many cases, 
the conflicts of the world today, the rise of fundamentalism, is particularly uh, in the geographies that you see it, is a direct consequence of lack of investments in human development, in opportunities for people, and in hope for a better, more secure future. Thank you. More questions? No? So I think that after a long, long day and a long, long week, week uh, let me, on behalf of East Global, uh, really thank you very much for this uh, true leadership uh, or, uh, session also that completes perfectly well this one-week course. And uh, I'm sure that from the many things that have been learned here, we'll also feed our research, we'll also feed some of our translation activities, and hopefully contribute, uh, even you. if in a, in a small way, to maternal, newborn, and child health uh, throughout the world, to make it also more equitable, as was described. So thank you very much. Uh, have a nice end of stay here in Barcelona, and have a safe trip back. Thank you.